just to explain to everybody watching, we did a really awesome like 40 minute interview and I totally screwed up the audio. So now we're watching the video of our interview and going over the audio portion. <laughs> no problem. That's the the nature of podcasting, right? Is if you're not you're not doing it right if you're not uh, having issues. I guess so. Um, cool. So you want me to just sort of discuss what we're seeing generally? Um, yeah, I know you just went through it all, but yeah, it's totally fine. So um, what you're seeing on screen is the Vorpal board uh, remote uh, game. A tabletop game system. It's a platform for playing your actual tabletop games with your pieces, your actual pieces and boards. And what I'm showing right now is the ability to do what we call hybrid video streaming. And so what it is, is a cell phone mounted over the table. And that cell phone will stream video at a lower resolution. But then if you put your mouse over it, which Adam is doing on the screen, it will show a very high resolution. And that allows you to, um, as a remote player, be able to see people's hands moving and dice rolling and, and minis moving around and stuff. But if you need to look very closely at something and actually read the text on the board or read, in this case, um, these health dials in the game Unmatched, you can put your mouse over there and then actually you can, you can tell very close up. Um, so hybrid video is one of the options that we have. And then the other option we just call photo streaming. And what photo streaming is, is it, it just sends very, very, very high resolution photos one after another um, at like maybe one frame per second. And this is what we're showing here. The cool thing about photo streaming is that the resolution we can get to is like off the charts, um, you know, up into 3200 by 2400 or 4000 by 3000 pixels. Um, so if you're playing a game that's very big uh, or you really want to be able to see the, the fine details, you can go photo streaming mode instead of hybrid video. Yeah, um, you are the red cursor and I'm the blue, as you can tell by the under indicate on the name. So I was trying to go through and showing people watching how it would be sitting in my seat because you were kind of the host of the thing. Yeah, so this is, yeah, that's fair. It is your view in this case. And you can see that the, the cursors are shared, right? So I can see Adam's cursor. He can see my cursor, which is the main way that while you're playing a game, you can communicate with each other. So as a remote player, you can say, oh, I want you to move my character here and I'll be able to see that he um, that he wants to move his his miniature and that I can, I can do it for him. Um, and so if you have five or six players in there, you know, it will show all their cursors on the screen at the same time and they'll all be color coded. And I believe now in your chat window, it, you were showing the arm of the phone because you were talking about how you include the arm with the the package, the verbal board package. Yeah, that's exactly right. So so we are including an arm. Um, the main reason being uh, that we did look at a lot of like cell phone mounting arms that are on the market and uh, and they really are not great. Uh, either they're too short or adjusting them is not very precise at all. And so what we did is we took a lot of uh, subcomponents that were available and sort of put them together into what we think is a really good um, cell phone mounting arm. It allows for 360 degree rotation. Um, it can be easily positioned very precisely and then tightened into that position uh, with screws. So it, it ends up in a much better experience than the stuff that we we're able to just sort of buy. Um, and it, you're not gonna like realistically for the the size and quality of, of the arm, a, a consumer wouldn't be able to buy something like that off the shelf. So uh, for that sort of price. So it was important that we wanted to make sure that like when this system, when somebody gets it, they can sit down, open the box and actually have like a good time um, quickly. So then the next thing we're talking about here is the card scanning box. Um, and it's again, it's more than just cards. It's really a component scanning box. But what it is, is I'm able to take game components, cards, uh, little um, uh, tokens and stuff, and I can scan them into the virtual session. So uh, what I just did is I put a card in there and you can see it just appeared. Um, and then that's a physical card that I have on my end um, that now Adam ha can see and interact with on his end. So he can actually uh, click it and drag it and zoom in on it, rotate it, all those sorts of things. Um, and you can see the type of quality that we're able to generate. So that's just a physical component. And if we were playing real time, I would be scanning his cards in and then, uh, he'd be able to have his own hand of cards inside Vorpal, um, independent from me on my end. 
Right, yeah, you can scan cards in set to a player so that the other players don't see their cards for games where that's important. Yeah, we'll see that in just a second. I think that's what I'm talking through now. But essentially, he can... Um, I can pick up the cards on my end. Any player can pick up a card. And, and when you pick up a card, it becomes visible to you. So you can see that this one is face down right now that just came in. Okay, that's and, right. I dropped the gun. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, and so this one's face down right now. And then... Um, I think I'm probably explaining it right now, but he's going to click on it and then click the pickup button. And when he clicks the pickup button, now he sees it and there's a little colored bar underneath it, which is an indication that it's his card. But on my side, that card is still um, flipped over the other way. And so we can maintain secrecy that way um, so that we can have people have their own hands. I'm going to probably pick this one up myself. So that's what it looks like if if somebody else owns the card. Um, and this way you can play, our goal is to play kind of like any game um, that you can pull off your shelf. And one of the hardest things to come up with a solution for was maintaining secrecy of components. And so many games rely on secrecy as part of their mechanics. So um, so this is kind of how we, we built the solution for that. You were also talking about a deck system, which I think is like coming soon or you're working on it. Yeah, that's part of the scope of the Kickstarter. Um, it's not in a state that we can really show anything off yet, but the idea is that if you had a game that had a deck of maybe 10, 15 cards that get used regularly, you could actually scan those cards into the system in advance um, and then have shuffling and drawing of cards and all that stuff right in Vorpal board. Uh, so you don't have to scan the cards as you're playing. Uh, and that's a big request from people on the Kickstarter. They really want to have deck support. So it's something that we're working on right now. Yeah, I thought that was a really cool feature because so many games are relying on that. Yeah. And, you know, like um, it, it, then it then it means that you have to spend 10, 15 minutes up front once doing the scanning. And then once all the stuff's in, it's in and we'll save it for future sessions as well. So um, it, it's a little bit of an investment at the beginning. And then you can just sort of play those games easily uh, going on. Yeah, that's very cool. And then one thing that I was just showing, um, I scanned in kind of a, a non-regular shape. So we scan in cards, rectangles, that's all fine. But we can also scan in tokens that are weird shapes. And in this case, I scanned in what looks like a keyhole token. And um, the app is smart enough to recognize the shape, cut the token out, um, and then bring it in uh, in that shape. So then if you're interacting with it in the digital space, it looks and behaves and can lay on top of stuff the same way that it does uh, in the physical space. Yeah, for people who didn't see the the keys on the bottom left of the screen and the bigger version that's kind of at an angle is physically on James's table and the smaller one next to it is actually the scanned version and it looks like it's just laying on the table. Yeah, what's kind of funny is sometimes when we play games um, on here, if we're doing kind of a mix of virtual and physical components on the table, um, it, it does sometimes like you reach with your mouse to like move something, but it's like not real. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or I'll reach with my hand on my end to like pick something up, but it's, but it's virtual. Digital. You know what yeah. I mean? So it's, yeah. So like, um, so it is, it is a little bit of a mind bender sometimes when you get in here and, and if you're playing, especially if you're playing a game that you know very well, um, that can help that, that, that can happen. Um, so now what we're doing is we're, we're showing dice. And so the, the dice system um, is a 3D dice roller that's built into Vorpal. Um, and you can roll, what, we're, what I'm demoing right now is kind of the standard D&D uh, &D dice uh, that we have in there, but we also have a, a custom dice builder that would let you define dice using um, uh, icons. So you could make a D6 that's for the game you're playing. There are a lot of games that have custom dice, um, things like Descent and Imperial Assault. We already have a dice builder, but um, we're when when Adam and I are talking here, we're right in the middle of converting our dice from 2D dice into 3D dice, and so uh, I'm not able to show those custom dice today. But but uh, but we are we can show the standard the standard sized uh, dice for D and D. Yeah, it looked like there was enough options to play pretty much any game. Uh, yeah, you know, and, and um, we've we've built some some weird dice, you know, like a, a game like Subterra or Subterra 2. They have like strange uh, dice where two sides are empty and, and one side is a little soldier or something. And so we want to be able to let you. I, I think it's important that the remote player gets to roll, not just that the player rolls for them, mm -hmm. um, because a, a lot of what we're hoping here is 
that it feels like you're playing the game when you're a remote player. And if you don't have that agency to like roll or move your own cards, it's kind of like you're just watching like a, a video of somebody playing. So it's important for us that that remote player is going to be able to kind of manage their own stuff, essentially. Yeah, one thing I really liked, and it's kind of going on right now, is I really did feel like I was sitting there at a table with you playing the game and I could put, you know, the chat windows on the left. It saves the rolls above it. I mean, above it compared to where I put it, but you can really put it anywhere. You know, I could put my hand on the bottom right or wherever you'd want it to be organized. And just the amount of freedom that it had, it wasn't like, okay, cards go in this container. And Yeah, and we're, we're so it's kind of a little bit of a double-edged sword, right? Because like, um, it does rely on the remote players to like keep their own stuff organized, right? Like put it, put it in spots where it makes sense. We're probably going to be adding in some, um, some organizational tools at least, so you can right now you can multi select components and move them all at the same time and stuff like that. But we're going to add some stuff where it's easier to select a bunch of cards and then kind of like group them together into a nicely organized hand um, just to make it a little bit easier. Because it, as it is now, since it's so free form, um, if you're scanning in a lot of stuff, sometimes the, the virtual space gets just like really cluttered. Um, and, uh, so we'll make that a little bit easier, but you're right, right? You can put the videos where you want them. You can size them up however you want them. Uh, a lot of times we'll put the videos right next to the cards for that person. Um, so you can kind of see, oh, here's this floating head of James. Here's all his stuff. Here's Adam said, here's all his stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's really free form. We kind of view ourselves as a set of tools to enable people to do these types of things. Um, and we're, we're trying to not overdo it with kind of like locking in the way you play, um, mainly because we want to work with as many games as possible. And as soon as you start locking stuff up and, and defining exactly where the cards go and how they interact, then somebody says, oh, well, I play this game where I want to like rotate the cards and like sit them on top of each other in this way. And like we want to support pretty much whatever we can. So, um, so yeah, we've erred on the side of kind of like of making it just sort of you know, work however you want it to work. And another thing to mention is that the white grid, like kind of table play area, I guess you could call it, is not limited to your window size. You can kind of drag it off. I mean, maybe you have cards that you don't need till the end of the game or something. You can kind of put them out of sight to keep your area cleaner, or you can zoom things out to get more room. Yeah, and that, that actually starts to become a lot more of a benefit when you're talking about playing with two or three players remotely. So um, if you don't want to see somebody else's like area where they're keeping all their hand and stuff, you can position your view so that you only see the board and your cards, right? So because most of the time you don't need to actually see the other people's cards, especially if you're playing like a co-op game or something. So when we play like Gloomhaven on it, we'll, people will zoom it such that they just see the board and then they see their character mat and their cards. Um, and here I am talking about the scanning box. So the, the component scanning box, it's made out of um, really high quality, like hardwood veneered plywood. Um, and then all that's laser cut. It all comes apart. Our goal is to make it so this whole thing can fold down um, and go away so you don't have to sit it on your table all the time. It's got a light puck that that comes out and then it's hinged. So everything goes flat and then you can put it in a box. Uh, you don't have to have it out on your desk all the time. Um, and um, and then we've made some custom versions for people who might be interested in following the um, the Kickstarter campaign. We have some custom versions of the box. I'm showing off the art right now that will be standard on the box. but. Um, we've made a couple that are, are specific to certain games, uh, that we're going to be giving away during the campaign. Um, and you can follow us on social media to, uh, to get notified of kind of like how to win those things. It's possible in the future that we, we change up what art is available for people, but, but, uh, out of the gate, that's going to be the standard art that you get uh, on the Kickstarter version. Yeah. I thought the, the box thing was really cool and how it all came together. Yeah, you know, the box, the box um, uh, was was the whole concept of, of how you scan cards face down was the biggest, I'd say, challenge of this entire project so far. I mean, we've had some programming uh, things that are tricky to program, things like hybrid video and whatever. But but um, mechanically to make this thing work, the hardest thing to figure out was like, well, if I pull a card off the top of my deck and I want to give it to a remote player, I can't see it because if I see it, then I know what it is and the whole thing doesn't work anymore. Uh, and then that would just limit how many games we could play. So it, we could still play co-op games because it doesn't really matter, um, but we wouldn't be able to play anything competitive. And so we went through a lot of prototyping and, and messing around to try to figure out a way 
to scan cards in face down. You know, I was looking at like business card scanners and, and desktop scanners and stuff like that. Um, and then the final solution was, oh, well, we, you know, we have these cell phones in our pocket. Why don't we just utilize uh, an app on a smartphone um, to to essentially detect the components inside the box and then uh, and then dump them into the game session? And that it works out really well. So. I think that's what you just started talking about in the original recording. Yeah. Um, yeah. You kind of touched your cell phone and you were talking about the uh, might be a little bit early, but I know at one point you were telling me about it can run. It doesn't have to be the latest and greatest. You don't have to go out and spend another eleven hundred dollars on the brand new iPhone to get it to work. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, that, it, like a, a big part of it, sort of the ethos behind this project for us is like make it so it's accessible. Um and part of that was making sure that our software on the app side could like run on as low spec devices as we could manage. Um, the the hybrid video, that kind of combo of video and and photos, that requires a little bit more powerful of a device just because it's like it's doing the video and then streaming it to all the the other players. But um, you can use a, a really old cell phone for the component scanning. And if you're doing photo mode for the board, the one that I test with, I think it's from like 2014. And, uh, and at that time was even not a flagship device by any means. Uh, I think I got it for like 20 bucks on eBay. Um, so yeah, we do want to make sure that we can just run on old stuff. Um, if you have an old broken phone in a, in a, you know, broken crack screen phone in a, in a desk drawer somewhere, we want you to be able to just connect it to Wi-Fi and then use it as, um, as either the board streaming, uh, device or the card scanning device. Right. Cause you were saying it, it doesn't require two phones to play a game. Um, if you only have one, you can just do your scanning up front and have it all in the system. And if yeah. you do happen to have two, it, you know, it's convenient, but not necessary. Yeah, it's not necessary. I mean, where, where it becomes necessary is if the game you want to play is just not feasible to do the scanning up front, like you have to scan things as the game is played, um, then you would need the second device. Uh, but there are tons and tons of games where you can get all your scanning done and saved beforehand and then, um, you know, just roll dice and draw cards out of the deck or whatever. Um, so so we see you know, and also things like tabletop role playing games, like you, you absolutely could just run with one one device, just the the board streaming device. Um, so uh, that's a question we get a lot: is do, do you have to have the two? And and the answer, unfortunately, is 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 maybe depending on what you want, <laughs> depending on what you want to play. You know, right. But between everybody upgrading their phones all the time and having people over, because you could also have you know four people in person and two remote, and just grab a second phone and you're good to go. Right. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. So so um, it, maybe it'll it'll give it'll give people something to do with that se with those old phones instead of like giving them back to Verizon um, for 50 bucks or whatever they give you. <laughs> right. um, so so, yeah, we hope we hope that we hope it's not a huge barrier for 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 lots of players. Um, you know, I'm I'm a little bit different because like I'm a software developer that works on phone stuff. So I have a lot of phones and, and I realize that's not the norm for for everybody. But hopefully with you know, um, partners living together or roommates or friends coming over or whatever, people are able to to make it work. Uh, I know at some point, too, you were telling me about, um, which I think is important for people to know, is that only the host needs the phone, really. Everyone else just logs into the website. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, the only person who needs the game is the host. The only person who needs an account on our system is the host. Um, the way that, that we're going to monetize this is that the only person who needs to pay for anything is the host. Um, and we're anticipating a monthly fee of $5 or an annual fee of $50 to use the system. Um, but then the remote players, they don't need anything. They just need a web browser. Um, they don't need an account. All they're going to need, if you look on the screen, there's like a session ID that you see on there. It says one, two, three, four, five. When the host creates the game, they get a session ID, which they would supply to the remote players and just say, hey, join my game. And the remote players can come to vorpalboard.com and jump into a game. Um, we're trying to make it. I don't know if you've played uh, Jackbox Party Pack uh, before. No. It's a it's it's a video game, but you can connect to it from your phone. And all you need is just like a six digit number, and you're connected. And I remember thinking like that's that's how we want this to be. We want it to be. I can just call my mom and say, "Hey, get your iPad. Type in this six digit number." And then she's connected and she can play like a board game with my kids, right? Like it can't be a big complicated process uh, that requires software installs and all that. Like that's just going to make it so people don't want to do it. Yeah, I, I thought that was a really nice point and good feature of it 
because it also leads to um, only one person really needs the Vorpal board server account, I guess you would call it. Um, everyone else just logs in like you were saying. They don't need to create a password. They don't have to supply a credit card. They literally just show up to play. Right. Yep, exactly right. And, and, and we hope that, you know, once the remote players... Like our vision, I guess, for how this spreads is kind of like starting with early adopter slash um, even, you know, game evangelist type people and them playing with their friends. And then those friends saying like, holy smokes, I'd like to do this with some other friends or my family or whatever. Right. And so the the experience for those remote players, we kind of view that as our opportunity to get get more users. Right. Like those remote players are free to come play and that's fine. And hopefully they see it and like it and uh, maybe they become subscribers uh, after the fact. Or maybe they don't. And that's fine, too. You know, either way. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about the the subscription? Um, yeah. So like our hope, uh, the, the target that we're anticipating is like a five dollar a month to fifty dollar a year. If you if you subscribe for the year type model, um, you know, no, you know, weird contract stuff. If you buy the year, you get it for the year. If you want to do five dollars per month and turn it on and off that's that's your prerogative i think what we're really hoping for is just like having a model that works for everybody if if you only get together with your D group three times a year or something just pay 15 bucks and and just pay every time you play um but if this is something that you get three or four plays a month um and it and for me that's kind of how it is um it, it for me like 50 dollars a year is like an absolute no-brainer to, to play three or four extra uh, board game sessions a month with my friends so um, we hope that that price point works for for everybody. Um, we did get some questions about, you know, why isn't there a free tier? Um, and yeah, th the answer to that is kind of twofold. Like we want this to be a maintainable business. We don't want to have to rely on ads and selling people's data and tracking what people are doing. You know, like anytime you you interact with a free service, like obviously there's a reason that it's free. Um, and, and the reason is that they're probably, uh, selling your data. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so we want it to be a maintainable system, um, that, uh, that we don't have to result to that resort to that type of stuff for. Um, and also we kind of view the free tier as the remote players. Like you can come and play this as much as you want for free, as long as you're playing with a host who has paid, right? It's not that everybody has to pay. Um, so we think that it's a good model. Um, we've, we've heard, you know, some people are, are, don't love it, but the majority of people who are interested in this product, like totally are on board with kind of how we're, we're monetizing. So hopefully it, it resonates with people. Yeah. I think the $5 a month or $50 for a year is you can't beat it. Yeah. I think if you I, use it one time a month, it's worth the five bucks. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing, I guess after every session I play online, I'm always a little bit anxious and nervous just about um are people going to like this thing right as, as somebody who creates stuff you, you, i think you're always kind of have that, that thing in the back of your head is like is this good um and so every time i play a game on it uh I, I always finish the session and i say like okay did i like really 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 like love that did i have a great time and and the reality is i'm, I'm going to be totally honest like it's not exactly the same as being in person with other people because it never will be exactly the same. But I always finish and I say, one, I had like a great time playing that game. The same kind of emotional response happened while I was playing the game. And two, there literally is no other way for me to have done this. You know, this is something that you just cannot do um, in any other system or, or way. People try to do this type of stuff in like Skype. Um, and the process while it, you can kind of make it work is just not comfortable for anybody. Um, and so, so I, it, as a, as a user, as a real user, um, I think for me, it, it has filled a, a big void in my life, uh, because I use it all the time. I, I stream multiple times a week, um, and play with my family and friends on it. And I think that people are, when they get their hands on it and actually play a couple sessions, it's going to really be a game changer for them, you know, for people who don't have the opportunity to get together with their with their gaming groups uh, regularly in person. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And uh, one thing we were talking about before is like me and my friends had talked about like, oh, wouldn't it be fun to start like a tabletop RPG, like a DD and d type thing? How would we do it with, you know, one guy in South Carolina, one guy in D.C., one person in a different time zone? You couldn't really do it over text. The game would take eight years to play. <laughs> um, you, you know, not everyone's available to get together that many times a year that you could even keep up with something, but this kind of solves all the problems. 
Yeah, I mean, we hope so, right? Like, um, there are some tools. There are obviously tools out there for for especially on the the tabletop RPG side, um, things like Roll Twenty or Fantasy Grounds, and like those systems are cool. I think they're really neat. Um, but but I think when people bring them up to me, the, the thing I guess I say is like, they're these are two different animals, right? Like Roll Twenty, like w- we we talk about like Roll Twenty as as like something that isn't even really operating in in very much the same space as us because. It's a totally different feel. You're 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 building digital assets. You're building digital maps. Everybody is remote. It 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 isn't the same as kind of like streaming a a, a grid on your tabletop that you're like writing on. You know, one of those like laminated grids or something. Um, there are going to be people who want to do their DMing inside a digital setup that want to have like the audio cues. They have like music they can do in there. All sorts of cool stuff in Roll Twenty, right? There are going to be people who want to play that way, and that's awesome. I think there there are people who want to to maintain the physical. They might have terrain that they use, um, or or you know they want to use their real physical dice and all those sorts of things. That you know we're hoping we resonate with those people. Um, but um, you know I, I I don't really I think I think all these systems are used for different for different purposes. So I think that we'll all kind of uh, coexist. Yeah, the the just the flexibility on this I think is really impressive that. You could play D and D, and then you could log into the same thing for the same five bucks you already paid with the same people, and play a different game the next day, and so on and so on. And there, there's really no no downside to that. Yeah, and you know, like it does. Like a, a great example of something that we play a lot on here that's just dead simple uh, is code names. You know, like we play. We have we have three couples, and each couple has a laptop at their house, and they sit on their couch. Um, well, I, I sit at the real table, but the other, the other people get the benefit of sitting in right. the couch. Um, and, and so we have, we have six people, uh, in three different locations and it takes literally no time to set up beyond just attaching my cell phone to the arm. And then we're able to play a totally workable round of code names, um, while seeing each other, you know, it's, it's like having a FaceTime call with your friends, um, and playing a game at the same time. Uh, and we want it to feel that easy. No, hey, it's going to take me a ton of time to set it up or, oh, man, it's going to take me, you know, scanning in a ton of stuff in advance. Like there are games that you'll want to do that. But if you just want to play something quick, you totally can do it uh, with this system. So you can get to, from the very complicated to the very simple, um, which comes back to that idea of just like we're trying to make simple tools and then we trust that the users will use them to play the games they want to play. Not so much that we're trying to build something very specific to one experience. Right. That's going to be the key, I think. Um, yeah, I think we kind of hit on everything we hit on the first time around. Cool. Cool. <laughs> um, if you want to, I know vorpalboard.com is the website. Uh, there's some good information there, some good demo videos. Um, you want to tell everyone else where else they can find you? I know you have a lot of gameplay videos up and yeah, we have a, yeah, if you, if you want to see kind of like what it looks like, um, we have a YouTube uh, channel under Vorpal board that just has, I don't know, 50, 60, um, full playthroughs of games. Uh, and then we strip, we stream on Twitch at least once a week, uh, at, at obviously at Vorpal board on Twitch. Um, and that's where our team, our dev team actually gets together and, um, and tests stuff out live uh which sometimes works better than others uh but that's been really neat because we've been able to take like live feedback from people and uh and chat about mechanics and and also get uh some pretty good ideas for features uh via that process and then we're on pretty much every social media platform we don't have a TikTok account i guess but we have everything else um at vorpal board the one we're probably the most active on is twitter so if you're interested in uh, in chatting or learning more um, I'm on there all the time. So hit me up at Vorpal board. And then, uh, otherwise just, uh, you can check out our video content, um, on Twitch and YouTube. And then the campaign is live until I believe February 20th. Um, and we are like 185% funded currently something around there. Um, and so we're hoping to, to get a real big push, um, to, to blow away that initial target by the end. So, uh, you can find us on probably the easiest way is either to go to vorpalboard.com. There's a link there. Or um, or just search for Vorpal Board two words on uh, on the Kickstarter website. Very cool. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to sit down, especially twice. <laughs> Sorry again <laughs> about the audio issues. Yeah, no problem. And uh, you know, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. All right, take care. You too.